Ladies and gentlemen, here's a tease of the interview that I did with Neil from Gnostic Informant. If you want to see the full video, go down in the description and check it out. It's a wonderful show we did with Dr. Michael Shermer, the author of Skeptic Magazine. Based on this book. Right. Well, um, I mean, you okay. you and I have well, all heard, see. we don't have to get into theology, but we've all heard God does not change his mind or God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, God knows everything. Well, when you read passages where it's clear that God does not know, all they do is, once again, the goalpost, they move it. So where it's like, um, Adam, where are you in the garden? You know, or, or like, uh, man, I, I repent that I made man. I, I, I shouldn't have destroyed them all. Like, or, or he's so angry that he did destroy them because he's like, man, uh, he's angry after the flood, at, at destroying all of mankind almost, almost. Like, these emotions that we're reading, she's saying, mm -hmm. don't slide past that. Don't let the theologians trick you. This is exactly what other ancient Near Eastern gods look like. And it's exactly mm -hmm. what they did. So when you see that, and you can use that against the apologists who are telling your grandma she's going to hell, she doesn't send 10% of her tithes in, this is stuff I combat. And I love doing that with Neil. We, we've been... We've been combating fundamentalism for a long time. People want to be theists. People want to believe in things. I get it. At the end of the day, we're all going to believe in some things that maybe we don't have the empirical data to, to support at the end of the day. However, some things are just ridiculous and harmful and traumatic, like <laughs> hell. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Well, uh, when I was researching and writing Heavens on Earth, I, I encountered this issue of... Uh, of di differences between religions on what happens in the afterlife. Where do you go? What's it like? And are you there physically? Or are you there spiritually? What does that mean? You know, my wh where would my pattern of information that represents my soul or my connectome, that's my all my memories or whatever, where is that? You know, some quantum field somewhere? Is it, is it in the cloud, the equivalent of whatever the cloud would be <laughs> in heaven? <laughs> and how old am I, you know, when I'm there? Uh, you know, and some, you know, some theologians go, oh, well, you, you, you'll be 30, you'll be resurrected and in, in, in heaven in a physical body. Well, how old is the physical body? 30, because that's the age Jesus was when he was crucified. <laughs> 30, well, yeah, 30 was, I was strong and young and had my better memory and a better body then than I do now. But I also have 37 more years of memory that I've accumulated and experiences since I was 30, because I'm 67 now. So where did those memories go? Uh, are they there in the same brain? How does that even work? And then of course others go, no, 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 forget this physical body nonsense. It's, you know, you're, it's just your soul. Well, what is that? Again, is that just my connectome that, you know, the complete uh, record of my memory? But there is no such record because no, it's not recorded in, in there in the head. You know, it's a, it's a continually edited process you know, it's not like there's a memory of my 25th birthday or say my 21st birthday. Uh, I have pictures <laughs> of that with me at my parents' house and my family was there. I, it, but, but it's that picture that I'm remembering now mm -hmm. more than the experiences themselves. So mm. what's the true memory? There is no true memory. It's, you know, it's a constantly edited process. And so what, what gets resurrected there? You know, which are the real memories or the memories of the memories and the edits of the memories of the memories. Wow. And, so on. and uh, the, you know, and by the way, it's not just religion that has this problem. The sci scientists who want to upload our minds into the cloud, people like Ray Kurzweil think we're going to live forever uh, through this mind uploading. No, they have the same problem. You know what? You know, whenever you choose to scan your connectome. Uh, and this can't be done, by the way, but let, let's just say hypothetically we get there and you'd have big enough computers to store the file and you and then you then upload it to the cloud. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, what's there? It, you know, the moment you're done scanning my brain, that's it. But I continue, you know, I, I'm having more experiences the rest of today. That's going to alter my my life experience a little and the next day even more and so on and as I continue on. So you've just made a copy of me at that particular moment that day that hour, that's my, who I am wow. at that moment. But there is no permanent self. The self is this kind of continuous process from step to step, day to day, moment to moment. And and so even, even the scientific attempt to achieve immortality is flawed for the same reason that the religions are. Hmm. Well, did Joe Rogan ever get you to do DMT? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> My wife forbids this. I'm not going down to Costa Rica. Totally <laughs> I don't. I don't blame you. I'm tempted, um, but uh... 
this Derek, is go ahead. If I was going to say this is an interesting question I'd like to ask you because you're a skeptic. Now, you're not just any skeptic. You're literally the skeptic magazine skeptic. OK, you're the guy that skeptic. <laughs> you're that skeptic. And in fact, you have <laughs> created a movement. In fact, I started calling myself a skeptic after I read uh, The Believing Brain. Um, and, and I'm fine with calling myself an atheist, even if people pigeonhole me, because I know that that definition also has a little flexive, flexible meaning, uh, unless you're talking metaphysical atheism, but I'm not even going there. I'm not making a Gnostic atheistic approach like I know. But at the end of the day, the question, I've never really heard anyone ask you this. All right, maybe they have, but I haven't heard you answer this ever. Where do you find meaning? Because I know I could give the answer. I know Neil could give the answer. We could give our own personal explanations of how we find meaning. But a lot of theists just can't imagine that if you don't mm. have that mind above you, that deity above mm -hmm. you, there's something that promises you afterlife or eternal life or something. How do you find meaning? And for you, yeah. Dr. Shermer, where do you find meaning in this life? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, I don't see how the promise of an afterlife gives this life meaning, if anything, and some philosophers argue this, that we're going to die is what gives life meaning that like, okay, mm. this is it. I mean, I could go, you know, I'm going to go on a bike ride this afternoon. I could get, you know, squashed by a, a truck and that's the end. So I better enjoy this moment with you guys right now. This is it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hope this doesn't happen. But, uh, but that's the idea that, that there's a terminus to the sequence makes every moment in the sequence all the more pregnant with meaning by the fact that it's going to end now. Okay. So that's one counter to it. But, you know, the whole uh, afterlife problem is fraught with other logical issues, not the least of which is, but but that doesn't that, if anything, degrade the value of the moment? If all this stuff we're doing now is just a precursor to the big game in the next life, you know, this, this, this you know, kind of uh, theater of the absurd we're living through is just a preliminary before uh, the, the big show and so on, then, then why bother caring now other than just reward and punishment in some cosmic mm. courthouse afterwards? Um, no, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think any of that makes much sense to me. In any case, whether there's an afterlife or not, you should assume that, that there isn't just in case. And, and either way, don't miss out on this life because this is the life you have for sure. Now, this is it. You 100% you know you're alive, uh, but you don't know with 100% that there's going to be another life after. So you better you better enjoy that. Okay, so where do I find meaning? Well, the way everybody else does through meaningful work and, and family and, and loving relationships and friends and, you know, a career that, you know, it, that it's driven towards something bigger than myself. I find meaning in uh, my uh, hobbies like cycling, working out every day, hikes with my dog in nature. You know, there's a lot of research on this and you know, going out into nature seems to make people feel good. I like that Absolutely. hikes in the woods and so on, barefoot on the beach, those kinds of things that were that the spiritual gurus kind of tell us are good. They are good. Yeah. There's research that shows that they're good. You know, I like to go into cathedrals. I also like to go into uh, astronomical observatories and I get the same experience. There's something about that that takes us takes you out of yourself so this is what the research says something that takes you out of yourself and into something bigger than you whatever that is science of course gives us that but anything you know volunteering for a nonprofit or you know manning the soup kitchens or you know helping somebody uh, that needs help and, and it's not about you you know it's not like giving the donation to the university to put your name on a building that that's right. not going to do it it has to be something that, <laughs> that that you value doing and it has you know some moral implications and so on those are the sorts of things that that, uh, that people you know getting married having kids building a family having friends all that uh, yeah. uh you know people say that's what makes life worth living and that's different than happiness so Good doing point. things that make you happy at the moment is short term and of course, that's all good. It's fun to you know go out to dinner with friends and and, and have a good time, and, but that then it's over. And then you know what happens next? Okay, maybe something bad happens, and then you're not happy. But uh, meaningful activities are long term. That that is, they have a longer time horizon, both forward and back. So you know, nostalgia of looking back on my life, thinking, well, this is what I've done, and then looking forward, given that I've done this, I want to do that. And, you know, and, and much of what I do is not fun. It doesn't make me happy moment to moment, 
but it makes me feel more purposeful and meaningful. Like my life has more meaning that I'm doing this uncomfortable thing, whatever that is. And working out is, you know, hard. I try I, when I work out, I try to do it hard and it's not fun, but I feel better afterwards. Or, you know, care uh, example, I give caretaking for my, my parents, you know, driving, schlepping my dad around to doctors and medical centers and all this stuff. It wasn't fun at all. It was exhausting. It was depressing. You know, it was just sad and so on. But I feel like I'm a better person for it. And of course, yeah. he, you know, I love my dad. And so he appreciated that. And I would want somebody to do that for me and on and on, you know, that. So, um, you know, much of what we do that you know, psychologists that study this just tell us we don't do it because it makes us happy. We do it because it makes us fulfilled, as purposeful, meaningful people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm thinking about what you're saying about like, like, for example, on a clear night, I lo- when I look up at the stars and I see everything, I get this like feeling like, how lucky am I just to be alive? Mm-hmm. And to, you, whatever the process of the Big Bang, whatever happened, that the result is that me being here, uh, being, you know, conscious of being able to d- do things and, and, and experience life. And then I hear people like Michael Craw or, um, um, Dr. Krauss talk about um, how the beginning of the universe was the size of an atom and then it expanded mm-hmm. to what it is now. That right there is like way more powerful than mm-hmm. any religion can mm-hmm. Just thinking about that. 